was cracking. Big dog. Oh. Plug your ass in. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE, and this is a BDGE champion. Where's this fucking logo? Champion crew neck hoodie collab now in stores bigdogsfantasy.com it's friday day before halloween i'm not gonna get dressed up today because we go live tomorrow to start q a patreon.com forward slash bdge today we're talking about rankings i just finished my rankings again also available right there we're gonna talk about them so it's what people do on youtube channels on podcasts we talk we're gonna talk it out so my favorite guys so my least favorite guys the guys we hate and we do hate it here we hate it almost everywhere but today in particular, things are getting weird. A lot of injuries, a lot of fuckery going around in backfields. I don't know, man. There's a lot to break down. We're going to do something new today. We're going to do something new today. Not. Shout out Borat. We're going to tuck our fucking shirts in. We're going to stop yelling. And we're going to eat. All right, in all seriousness, I need to bring the energy. I know that. I know that. I know that. If you're if you enjoy the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you are new. If you're listening via podcast, we're like we're we're like four reviews away from hitting 500, I believe. So, if you are listening via the ear hole, please drop a rating and a review. It would help me out massively. Running bikes. Let's talk ball carriers. <sighs> Ezekiel Elliott versus the Philadelphia Eagles is a matchup, is a player, is a situation in which I want zero, zero part of. I have him all the way down at running back 16 in my rankings. That is probably the lowest Zeke has been in his entire, maybe week one of his rookie year when people were questioning what the workload would be like for Zeke. I'd imagine he hasn't been below running back 16 since then or at running back 16. He probably hasn't been outside the top 10 since then. But this week he is. This week he is. And ECR has him at fucking running back five for some reason. What are we doing? ECR is, is starting to be like the new Yahoo ownership percentage where like it's fucking worthless because nobody actually does them. I'm starting to think that the people that do the rankings don't even fucking, I don't even know where they get the, doesn't matter. Nothing about this game for the Cowboys is looking good. We're probably going to have Ben DiNucci in at quarterback, which is a massive problem for everybody on this offense. Okay. Now, Dalton's in the concussion protocol, but so it, it, it there's a chance, there is a chance that he is back for this game, but I'd put it at less than 50-50, okay? If Ben DiNucci is under center, they're going to struggle in every aspect because they're going against Philly, and their front seven is ferocious, whereas the Cowboys, fat boys up front, the Hog Mollies, are the opposite of ferocious, okay? Whereas Zeke has ranked inside the top 10, inside the top five in terms of run blocking efficiency, which is a free metric on playerprofiler.com. Go to playerprofiler.com, type a player in running back, one that gets carries behind a run blocking line. So you can actually have that statistic for you and you can scroll down and you could see this year he is ranked 33rd among running backs. That is probably the lowest he's been in since he's joined the league because their offensive line has always been very good, but they are banged up and they're not the same offensive line that they have been. Now you have Philly's run defense, Number nine per PFF, number three overall in adjusted yard lines per football outsiders. They're very good at defending the run. What does Zeke do best? He scores touchdowns. What are the Cowboys not going to do with Ben DiNucci under center? Score touchdowns. You look at Vegas, they have Dallas pinned at 16 and a half points. That is their scoring total for this week 16 and a half points. Only the Jets have a lower team total this week than the Cowboys. Nothing about this is enticing with Zeke. Okay. I know the name is there and I know we want to start him because he's Zeke. This could very well end up being like a 16 for 50 rushing line, three for 20 stat line through the air. I just don't see any path to efficiency for Zeke this week. And he's going to need to score to make him a good start. And as I said, what are they not going to do this week? Score. So if Dalton is in the lineup, yes, Zeke will get probably back into the top 10 or so. Still not an enticing matchup, but if Ben DiNucci's under center, I'm not saying you have to sit Zeke, but all the way at running back 16, there is a decent chance that you have two to three running backs if you're a good team ranked ahead of Zeke. So it's possible that you do actually bench him this week. 
And me saying that probably means he's going to fucking pop off for three touchdowns. But Devin Singletary will not pop off for three touchdowns. You could, I could put, put it on my mama. I put it on my mother, okay? He's going against the Patriots. And just like last week, I am way lower than ECR and Singletary. I had him outside the top 30 last week. He's at running back 35 this week for me. And he's running back 22 in ECR. Doesn't make zero fucking sense. Makes zero, zero, zero sense. You look over the last month of the season, 3.6, 3.2, 2.3, 3.1 yards per carry. Over his last four games, those are his yards per carry. That's not going to get it done when you're getting 10 fucking carries a game like Devin Singletary is. He's not getting the goal line work. He's also not catching passes anymore. I thought that was kind of going to be his role in this offense. He's gotten two targets, one target, and one target over his last three games. Those are his target totals. And now he's splitting snaps evenly with Zach Moss. So nothing about this looks good either, man. Zach Moss, spike from the foot injury, toe injury, whatever the fuck he had. But they split snaps 53 to 47 in terms of snap percentage last week. And I expect that to continue to be the case going forward, if not even leaning a little bit towards Moss soon. So unless you're in pure desperation mode, like you're animal, like you have animals team in the E-Town get down, who he's probably fucking got Singletary in his like a low end RB1. I can't imagine any part of Singletary being in any of my lineups. The rest of the running backs, I don't know if I want to go like sit start, but there are a lot of random situations that I just feel like need to be covered right now. We have a lot of committees being formed. We got a lot of injuries. So we're just kind of go down all the lists that I think some situations or conversations are a bit polarizing. Okay. So there's going to be a polarizing episode in a sense. Ronald Jones on pace to have a big year, except Leonard Fournette has shown up. Leonard Fournette has shown up and I think he is here to stay. I actually have Fournette ranked higher than I do. Ronald Jones. I have Fournette at running back 19. I have Ronald Jones at running back 22. Sorry, I got distracted for those last like 15. Sometimes when I podcast, when I record shit, it's kind of like um, kind of like when you're driving and don't look down at your phone. It's not good to, to text and drive. Sometimes when you're driving and you like focus out of something, you know, and then you, your brain like turns on 30 seconds later and you're like, how fuck did I just get home? I was like on the other side of town. I'm home. How many red lights did I blow? How many fucking people did I kill along the way? That's kind of what I do with podcasting and YouTube sometimes. I'll just be like rattling shit off. And then like 30 seconds later, I'll pop back into my soul. I'm like, what did I just say? I bet it was fucking good. I bet it was really good. I probably killed some people along the way. Wouldn't have it any other way. That's just what happened there. I don't remember what I just said. But I have Fournette running back 19. I have Ronald Jones running back 22. So for me, they're both in the RB2 conversation securely. This is a really good Tampa Bay offense right now. It's starting to click, even with all the injuries. We have Chris Godwin who's going to be out, which means more work in the passing game for a guy like Leonard Fournette, who has been announced as the pass catching back in this backfield. And Antonio Brown, I don't believe, is playing week eight. He's going to be back week nine, or he's going to be in the lineup week nine. So for right now, they've got really no one to throw the ball to. And we'll talk about Mike Evans in a minute because we talk about shadow corners, shadow coverage. Mike Evans going to get James Bradbury, Chris Godwin, not on the field. Rojo's been running great, but the leash, the leash is not long. The leash has been snipped, retaped, and it's about this long. He dropped the pass last week, which officially led Fournette to, you know, become the pass catching back here. And the problem is the longer Fournette is on the field, like the more playtime overall he gets, the higher the likelihood of him starting to eat away at Ronald Jones's workload. It might not happen this week. It might not happen in two weeks. It might happen over the course of a month where he's playing 35% of the snaps because he's the third down guy, which was not the case. Last week, he actually played more snaps than Rojo, got more touches and overall opportunities. So we could continue to see that going forward. Last week was a bit of a blowout. So it's hard to take those numbers concretely and, and take an overall conclusion from those. But when you have a guy like Fournette, it's only a matter of time before Bruce Arians realizes like, oh, from an NFL head coaching standpoint, you want a workhorse back because you don't want defenses to know what you're doing, right? Like that's why you can't have a guy like Jordan Howard be successful in this Miami offense because they want to keep a guy on this field like Miles Gaskin who can do all three downs, who could do all three downs successfully because defenses can't scheme towards one. You know, they, Jordan Howard goes on the field, you know, he's fucking running it right up the middle. When you have a guy like Leonard Fournette who can do all three, right? He could play on all three downs. He could run the ball. He could break away. He can catch the ball. He can pass block. That gives him a pathway to, I guess, getting in Bruce Arians' good graces, right? He's a guy who's utilized workhorse running backs in his past. And I think if there's one guy that has the path to do that, it is Leonard Fournette, not Ronald Jones. I do think this will be a committee moving forward for sure. But here's the thing, like Fournette is going to get at least half of the valuable fantasy touches in that committee, right? He's going to get the receptions. He's probably going to catch like five balls a game going forward because that's what Tom Brady running bikes do. They catch passes. 
and they break fucking hearts. So he's getting half of the valuable touches. The other half are the goal line carries because this is an offense. They're projected to have a team total of 28 points. Okay, so they're, they're projected to score at least four touchdowns this week against the Giants. The other half of the valuable touches are those goal line carries. Right now on the year, Fournette and Rojo both have three goal line carries apiece. If Fournette takes that over and Rojo is kind of diminished to like 12 to 13 carries, 14 carries between the 20s, this could be a wildly valuable area for Fournette. I really think that like the buy window on Fournette is right now. And if you don't get him, you'll probably be sorry that you didn't get him now for like low end RB2 flex prices because I think he's going to be a solid RB2 the rest of the way. It's not a great matchup for Fournette particularly against the Giants defense because they've actually been very, very stout against uh, opposing running backs. But give me the 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 pass catching running back in this offense over Ronald Jones. Again, both of them inside the top 22 running backs. So you could start both of them as flexes or RB2s, whatever, 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 whatever. But I will say that I, I, I like Fournette a lot going forward as well as in this week. Injuries. Let's talk about injuries, man. There's a lot of them. We have Aaron Jones with the calf. And I was pretty, I was pretty sure that I'm going to be looking up as we're kind of, as I'm talking, you know, as again, I fucking float out of my soul and I'm podcasting and talking and doing research and looking up the latest breaking news and stuff like that. You know, I'm like a fucking, I'm the triple threat with the ball in my hands. What we've heard about Aaron Jones is they might hold him out again. They might hold him out. It was not supposed to be serious and he was almost playing last week and, oh, we got some updates on... Ben DiNucci seems more likely to start week eight as Andy Dalton remains in the NFL co- concussion protocol. Adam Schefter reports a Bucks equipment staff member has tested positive for COVID, but that Monday night's game against the Giants is not currently in doubt. All right, all right, all right. Uh, what else we got? What else? Okay, so Aaron Jones got the calf. They might hold him out again. They might hold him out again. Uh, if they don't, then obviously this is irrelevant. But if they do, Jamal Williams becomes an RB1 for me. Had almost 115 yards last week, five targets, 23 touches overall. They get Minnesota, not a great run defense. They allowed Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams when they played him back in week one to combine for eight catches. That's going to be mostly Jamal Williams because A.J. Dillon can't fucking catch a cold right now in the flu season, in the COVID season. Motherfuckers immune from all the diseases. So Jamal Williams pops up easily to a top 10 running back if Aaron Jones sits again, which I guess right now is 50-50 if they want to rest him again. Devonta Freeman, ankle injury. I haven't heard much. I know he was like on the side of practice like doing something with trainers, but wasn't actually on the field. So the fact that he's kind of like on his feet, though, tells you that it's more likely a low ankle sprain than a high ankle sprain, which is kind of good news. And their game is Monday night, so he gets an extra day to rest on top of the fact that it happened on Thursday night football. Wayne Gallman becomes the guy if he doesn't play, but this is a brutal, brutal matchup. Tampa Bay, arguably the best all around defense in the NFL right now from pass to rush. I have Wayne Gallman down like RB 24 to 26 range. I don't feel good about that. To be honest, it's just like fucking Spider-Man meme with Zeke. It's just tough defense, not a good O-line, not a good situation, not a good matchup. He'll probably get the volume, but that's about it. So he's he's more of an RB3 flex for me than a good start. And that goes the same with Devonta Freeman if he does end up playing. Miles Sanders, man. Ah, fucking killing me, dog. Get on the field. How are you going to hurt yourself at the end of a 75-yard run? So much hope and so much promise. Everything we ever wanted as Miles Sanders owners. It all just comes crashing down in like two seconds. It was just taken away from you. Such is life. Such is fucking life. Miles Sanders, I'd be surprised if he played this week, to be honest. Great matchup against Dallas. He probably would have ripped off like a buck 80 against them on the ground. I really hate it here. I hate it here. I told you that in the beginning of the video, and I'll resurface that theme for the remainder of the video. But Boston Scott, if Miles Sanders doesn't go, becomes a plug and play, like high-end running back too. The only thing I'm minorly concerned about with Boston Scott and I'm probably reaching here a little bit, but this is something I brought up in like the last four videos in a row. Dallas does not allow running backs to catch passes against them. They allow a shitload of yards and production on the ground, right? Antonio Gibson last week didn't catch shit, had a lot of groundwork. Week before that, Kenyon Drake didn't catch shit, had a lot of groundwork. Like that's what they do. They allow a fuck ton of yards on the ground. They don't allow anyone to catch passes out of the backfield though. And that's Boston Scott's thing, right? Like you're not expecting him to go 20 for 120 on the ground. You're expecting him to go 14 for 62 and five for 35 and hoping that he kind of gets into the into the end zone there so I, I think we could see something like that where he actually goes like 14 for 70 gets in the end zone three receptions maybe I think he's a solid RB2 if Sanders is out I'm not gonna go like crazy crazy on Boston Scott I mean given all the injuries in fantasy football right now you, you probably have no choice but to throw Boston Scott into your lineup and same goes for Gio Bernard man Mixon likely to miss another week if not multiple weeks and Geo falls into that same range. 
right? I don't think they're like good enough, talented enough to be like straight RB ones, but just given the context and the situation around everything in fantasy right now, they kind of are, or at least high end RB twos. And like the Cowboys uh, going against Boston Scott, the Titans allow almost nothing to pass catching running backs too. Uh, 21 receptions on the year in total, which is the second lowest number of running back receptions this year tied with the Dallas Cowboys. And they've allowed the fourth fewest receiving yards two running backs on the year so i don't expect a boom game from geo unless he kind of like falls into the end zone twice or something like that but again solid rb2 assuming mix and misses time so if we're looking at those like filling guys the filling guys and we're ranking them right now i have jamal williams up at rb8 i have geo at i think rb12 and then boston scott rb14 15 so all of them are like very very solid solid plays jamal williams is my favorite play here based on matchup based on usage based on just him i think being a better running back than the other two Philip Lindsay in the concussion protocol obviously becomes uh, Melvin Gordon's backfield. Could be a little revenge game. Revenge game against Chargers. You should have fucking paid me my money. And they're all going to be like, no, even if you went for 250 this game, we still shouldn't have fucking paid you. You're a moron. But he's playing pretty well. He's playing pretty well. Chargers are a tough defense, though. Chargers are a tough defense. They got Justin Jones back last week. They got Melvin Ingram back last week. And Melvin Ingram did leave the game at the end. Like, it looked like he was hurt, and he's been limited at practice with a a knee injury, I believe. So you'll have to kind of monitor those reports, though. Melvin Ingram's not like a, you know, he's not, he's a pass rusher. He's a beast. Beast getting the backfield. But I have have Melvin Gordon up at, like, running back 15-16 if Lindsey does not play. Gordon's quietly been, like, really solid this year. He's averaging uh, over 14 and a half half PPR fantasy points per game. And he missed, you know, he missed some time, obviously. But in the games that he's played, one game against Tampa Bay, where obviously they were just stifled and, and shut down like most uh, opposing offenses are. Outside of that game, though, his touch counts have been 18, 21, 25, and 19. So I would say he's got a floor of about 18 touches against his Chargers defense, and he can get anywhere up to probably 24 or 25 touches. So those are like legit fantasy touch volume numbers. And you can make the case, if not even probably easily make the case, that he should be right there in that Boston Scott Geo range. I think I like their matchups a little bit better and their usage in the passing game. But it's kind of nominal at this point. I think he's a solid, like a solid, solid RB2 if Lindsay is out. And then we have two more super fucking messy situations here. Very messy situations in Baltimore and in Seattle. Different coasts, same fuckery. We have Mark Ingram coming off the bye. He's still not practicing. Like, I'm pretty sure we knew that he had a high ankle sprain. And I don't know why they're pretending like he's going to play this week. I, he's not going to play this week. Uh, it's going to be the Gus Bus show and J.K. Dobbins. Normally, I'd be excited to start both of these guys, except they're playing against Pittsburgh, and you literally couldn't ask for a worse defensive matchup than with the Pittsburgh Steelers, especially for thy running backs. Now, Gus will take Ingram's role, right? The early down thumper, and at this point, he's probably a better suited running back to do that, given what we've seen from the old man this year. But back to Pittsburgh, man, the season high that they've allowed in rushing yards to opposing running backs is 80 by Miles Sanders. And if you remember that game, Miles Sanders ripped off a 74-yard run. The season high is 80, and that was from a running back that ripped off a 74-yard run. They let up 75 rushing yards to Derrick Henry last week on 25 carries. They held fucking Saquon to 6 yards, Kareem Hunt to 40 yards. So it's not like they're looking good because they're going against shitty backs. They're going against very, very, very top-of-the-line running backs and holding them in check. Uh, So if those guys can't do it, I don't know why the fuck Gus Edwards would be able to do it. They also allow very little through the air. Man, it's ugly. It's ugly. So case in point, like it's exciting that Ingram's kind of out of the picture and we get to see more of a a role for J.K. Dobbins. I don't think it's going to amount to much because this second, this, uh, this front seven, also fucking ferocious. Their pass rush is top three in the league. Their run defense is top three in the league, if not number one in both of those categories. And Baltimore's offensive line has not been the same this year. I think they're going to get a shitload of pressure on Lamar. Uh, I don't think they're going to have a lot of success on the ground. So... They're like, I, I've Gus at RB27, Dobbins at 29, because I wouldn't be surprised. They just trust Gus, man. Like, they trust him not to fuck anything up. And I don't know if we've seen that trust from the coaching staff in a guy like Dobbins. Like, he's legit averaging like four carries a game. So I wouldn't be surprised if Gus ends up leading the backfield in touches by, you know, three to five, almost in that count range. Um, so I, I have him as running back 27. I have Dobbins as running back 29. But I don't feel good about starting either one of them. You could probably flip that in PPR leagues. Flipping to the other coast. This is like the biggest shit show right here in Seattle. It's so difficult because you never know what Pete, like Pete Carroll just says things about injuries that give us no content. Like Pete Carroll probably thinks Dak Prescott's suiting up next week. If he was on Seattle, he'd be a game time decision. So you look at Chris Carson, 
dealing with the midfoot sprain. And that's what Joe Mixon has been dealing with. And that's usually a week to week injury. And they're saying he's a game time decision. So do with that what you want. I would be, I would personally be surprised if Carson suited up. And if he does, he's at a very high risk for re-injuring that foot, which leads us to like four more guys. So we got Carlos Hyde. None of these guys practiced yesterday. I'm filming this Thursday. You're watching or listening to this either on Friday or Saturday. But on Wednesday, none of these guys practiced. Carlos Hyde with the hamstring and Travis Homer. I think he's got something with his knee, a knee contusion or some shit. I don't expect Travis Homer to play. Uh, Carlos Hyde's hamstring injury sounds pretty insignificant. So keep a very close eye on the practice reports there. If he plays, if Carlos Hyde plays, he's a preferred back to own in this backfield because he'll get a ton of the touches, but they are going against San Fran, which San Fran's defense is starting to get a little bit healthy week by week. And we're seeing them really fucking click and really turn on. And at full strength, this is not a defense you want to fuck with. Um, so I don't like the matchup here. It, it sucks because all these guys that can fill in or like waiver wire pickups or some shit are all going against tough ass defenses. So you don't feel good about any of them, but relatively we have to feel great because you can't feel fucking good about anybody. Nobody feels good about nothing. If so fact, though, the math checks out. As always, shout out to TI-83. DJ Dallas, though. I fuck with DJ Dallas very heavily. He was a prospect coming out of the University of Miami that I liked significantly when he got drafted to Seattle. Uh, fourth round pick. DJ Dallas is a guy that fits what Seattle does very well. He's a really tough runner. Built well, 5'10", 217, so he's got the real workhorse size. More importantly, when you got a thumper like that, you assume they're not going to be involved in the passing game. However, he has a receiver background. He was a receiver in high school, came in to be a receiver at Miami, and then switched positions uh, like halfway through his career and became a running back and did so successfully. So he could play on all three downs if asked to. Now, with all these guys injured, right, Homer, Carson, Hyde, it's possible that like two of, two of those three guys play. But it's also possible that none of those three guys play and DJ Dallas is in line for a huge workload. If that's the case, if DJ DJ Dallas needs to be owned because his range of outcomes here could be all the way up at RB2. If those three are out and DJ Dallas is sitting on your wire, grab him and you could play him as a pretty solid flex play because I'm pretty sure he's going to catch the ball at a significant rate because, again, very good pass catcher. And you want pieces of the Seattle offense. You just want pieces of the Seattle offense because they're going to score about 79 points. Probably not against the Niners, but let's talk about wide receivers. Let's talk about wide receivers. If any time you just want to grab the rankings, they're available. Patreon.com forward slash BDGE. Uh, make sure you follow me on the socials as well at Nick underscore BDGE. And then Instagram, just my name and the brand account is also at Big Dogs Fantasy. Wide receivers, who is expected to get shadow coverage this week? We have Stefan Diggs versus Stefan Gilmore. Uh, let me let me do a little research on Mr. Gilmore right now. Julian Edelman out with some knee procedure. Okay, so we have Stefan Diggs versus Stefan Gilmore. That is obviously a matchup that not fantastic, but Gilmore's actually been semi beatable this year. The defense overall for the Pats has been down, so I'm I'm firing up Diggs with with pretty high confidence. I think I have Diggs up at mm, wide receiver 14. So he's down a little bit in the rankings, but still a really rock solid high end wide receiver too. The targets are there, even though the production's dipped a little bit from Josh Allen. Stefan Diggs still getting like 10 targets a game and any one of those he could break for a big play. Mark Cooper versus Darius Slay. Listen, you just want absolutely fucking nothing to do with Ben DiNucci. Okay. Mark Cooper, I got him down at fucking wide receiver uh, 25. So he's not even a wide receiver two for me right now. One, strictly because of the offense. I don't think, you know, Cooper's going to catch more than six balls for 60 yards, if that. And two, Darius Slay is just a good corner. So like nothing, nothing good here for Amari Cooper in this one. This is a tough pill to swallow. Adam Thielen versus Jerry Alexander. This is not a good one. Uh, Jerry Alexander has just been absolutely lights out, shut down. And uh, Adam Thielen has been fucking awesome too. But this is just not a player who I want in my starting lineups. Let me take that back. You have to start Adam Thielen, obviously. He's my wide receiver nine. But had he not been going against Jerry Alexander, he's usually, he's been like a top three wide receiver week in and week out. So just something to notice. I think this could mean a very big game from Justin Jefferson. Fucking drink. All the guy does is produce. Uh, but if Jerry Alexander is on Adam Thielen, it's going to open up the other parts of the field. Mike Evans. Mike Evans has been just a weird, weird fucking year. Scores touchdowns. I'm pretty sure he has more touchdowns than yards this year. Every time Chris Godwin's on the field, Evans does absolute shit. His target share plummets. Nothing is good. Godwin's out though. But Mike Evans gets James Bradbury. James Bradbury has been a fantastic shadow corner this year. So I think Mike Evans, you want to, you want to love him this week because Godwin's out and you're assuming that he's just going to get a shitload of volume, but this is a game where 
The Patriots are heavy, heavy favorites in this. Let me actually verify. Let me do a little verification process on what the line is for this game. I want to say it's 12, maybe 12 and a half. If I had to guess. 11 and a half right now. So game script, I don't know how much passing we're actually going to get out of Tom Brady and the Patriots to begin with, right? Don't know how much passing we're going to get for Mike Evans. So the volume might not be there. And then he gets a really tough matchup. Of course, he's always a, a threat to go for two touchdowns. Just lob him up a fucking red zone, a red zone Yahtzee up there, and he can come down with two of them. But I'm looking at him as more of a low end wide receiver one, high end wide receiver two than like the surefire wide receiver six or whatever most people are probably going to be looking at when it comes to Mr. Michael Evans. So those are the four shadow. We got Stefan Diggs, Stefan Gilmore, Mark Hooper, Darius Slay, Adam Thielen, Jerry Alexander, Mike Evans, James Bradbury. What else we got? Uh, I like Jarvis Landry this week. I like Jarvis Landry. I like Rashard Higgins too. I like both of these guys, low key. Um, I know that, you know, it's weird, man. I, I think I need to adjust my rankings a little bit because OBJ's out and you're assuming that they're going to go extremely run heavy against Vegas, right? That's their weakness, the run defense. So how can I like Higgins, Landry, and Harrison Bryant when we talk about tight ends? I think my favorite start is, is probably Jarvis Landry here. Um, I have them all the way up at wide receiver 22. Jarvis Landry is going against the second worst slot cornerback in the league, and that is LaMarcus Joyner on the Raiders. Uh, that is per PFF. Coverage grading, second worst cornerback in the NFL. And no OBJ, this is going to be a target funnel offense. Mostly to Landry, mostly to Kareem Hunt, and then sprinkle to Higgins and, and Harrison Bryant. So uh, I like the Landry matchup as well. If we're looking at other guys that I have much higher than consensus, right after Landry, Fucking bike to bike. We got Landry at 22, Corey Davis 23, AJ Green 24. So I have Corey Davis and AJ Green much higher than consensus, and they're playing against each other. I expect a lot of points to be scored. Uh, both of these defenses are pretty atrocious when it comes to defending the pass, and both of these quarterbacks have been putting up numbers. Now, I know AJ Brown is a guy to own there, but Jonas Smith is clearly a little bit banged up. So I think second in targets will probably go to Corey Davis. I like his matchup this week. Uh, secondary for Cincinnati's absolute Swiss cheese. Fucking holes everywhere. A.J. Green, slowly been turning it on. Slowly been turning it on. I know most of it's a product of Joe Burrow just getting a shit ton of volume. But Joe Burrow's been getting a little bit more accurate week by week. Um, I was looking at the stats today on, on deep targets. A.J. Green has 14 deep targets on the season. One of them has been deemed catchable. One of 14. 7.1% of his deep targets are catchable per PFF. That is the lowest percentage in the league. So if Joe Burrow can continue to improve and can continue to get better and better and maybe throw one or two accurate passes towards AJ Green, we could see a big, big explosion game on the way. What else do we got? Anyone else I really like? I got Denzel Mims 15 spots higher than consensus. He's wide receiver 56 for ECR. I have him at 41. Crowder missed practice again. Uh, Brashad Perriman's in the concussion protocol. So he could, again, be the only outside weapon for the New York Jets coming off the seven-target game, which was over 30% of the target share in New York for Sam Darnold. They're going against the Chiefs. They're probably like 42-point underdogs, so they're going to have to throw the ball a lot. I could I could see Mims ending with 10 targets this game if Crowder and Perriman are out. So he's not the worst uh, pickup in flex. He ain't the worst. Uh, some other injuries that we're dealing with, Chicago. Allen Robinson's in the concussion protocol as well. Uh, by this time, you might have a better read on it than me, but Darnell Mooney and Anthony Miller both become very interesting plays in my opinion. Darnell Mooney has been a stud outside of the actual statistics. If you watch this guy play, he's open downfield on like every deep fucking route. It's ridiculous. He was in that. I tweeted out today. Uh, let me find the tweet. While I was doing the deep target research, I said lowest catchable target rate on deep passes this year. It was AJ Green at 7.1%, 7 Darnell Mooney at 9.1%. So he's had 11 deep targets, and one of them has been deemed catchable. And I feel like most of us actually know this now. Thank thankfully, people can see how good Darnell Mooney is relative to how shitty his quarterback play has been. Because for some reason, the Bears are on primetime TV like every single fucking week. And every single week, we see Darnell Mooney get wide open past the secondary. And Nick Foles or Mitch Trubisky, whoever the fuck is under center, wildly overthrows him. But he is open. Like if he was in the Chiefs offense... He would be, he's like what everyone wants Miko Hardman to be and actually a, a good player. Ooh. Ooh, that one hurt a little bit. I know, I know some people are pissed off right now, but if Robinson's gone, it's going to be Mooney and Anthony Miller and Jimmy Graham, Jimmy Graham in the rankings. If you are a Patreon member and you go to the rankings, you'll see at the bottom of all the rankings, all the guys that are questionable, concussion, concussion, hamstring, groin, knee, like those kind of things. Those guys are listed at the bottom of the rankings. As we get more news, I will adjust everything accordingly. So let's talk about tight ends. 
Eh, nothing I love too much here. I don't like TJ Hawkinson this week, really. Uh, against Indy, they've been so, so stout against opposing tight ends. They've let up almost nothing. So I would look elsewhere if you could. What else we got? Uh, I got Robert Tanyan up at 11, but I probably should move him down. He's coming off of like back-to-back -back disappointing performances. And now with Devontae Adams there, he will probably get like 71 targets and Tanyan will probably get four again. But Harrison Bryant is the guy I brought up. He was my tight end 12. So he was a tight end one for me with Austin Hooper out again and OBJ gone. Like Harrison Bryant looked really good last week. He was a really polarizing prospect or not polarizing, but like talented, tantalizing fucking everything you look for in a tight end prospect, Harrison Bryant has. And now he's putting it on the field putting in NFL production into his resume, which is what you want to see, right? It's fun when everyone's athletic and they do it in college and they do it at the combine, but you still need to be good at football. You still need to be able to come to the NFL, get on an NFL field and produce. And that's what Harrison Bryan did last week. So I think uh, you could do a lot worse than Mr. Harrison Bryant. You cannot do a lot worse than Mike Kosicki. He just fucking stinks. I remember like in week two, he had a big game, and then I was told that I was really wrong about Mike Kosicki. We're not going to go down a personal rabbit hole here. At the end of the year, we will. We'll go over all the lessons learned, all the things I got wrong, all the things I got right, which is like four things at this point. But what else we got? I got nothing crazy on Carson Wentz, or on the quarterbacks, but I was looking at Carson Wentz because he's ECR, ECR six. I have him down at 12. Uh, I'm probably a little bit too low on him, but I'm, I'm not ready to just trust Carson Wentz right now. I'm just not. Even though they're playing Dallas, Dallas' defense fucking stinks. They don't get to the quarterback. They can't cover wide receivers. This could be a game where they just really don't pass the ball a lot. And I'm trying to convince myself on the spot, which is probably not a good idea. So I'll probably move Carson Wentz up a little bit into the real like solid quarterback one range. But I do feel like quarterback six is pretty fucking high. It's going to be above guys like Josh Allen. It's going to be above guys like Tom Brady, Justin Herbert. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about all that. All right, fuck, fuck quarterbacks anyways, though. Defense, Kansas City, number one. Philadelphia, number two. Tampa Bay, number three. Everybody else fucking stinks. Get one of those three or get the fuck out of here. All right, that's the video. I'm sorry I ended like that. But we we started strong. The middle was strong. It was fucking cream filling in there. And I'll be bike tomorrow. Tomorrow's live stream is on Patreon. If you sign up here, you'll get access to the Patreon live stream where you can answer or you can, I'll, I mean, I'll fucking try to answer, but you could ask. Any sit starts you have, any trade questions, waiver wire questions, life questions, whatever you got, I'm here to answer. Tomorrow's live stream, patreon.com forward slash BDGE. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed, and don't forget to leave the rating and review on podcasts. Even if you just watch via YouTube, go to podcasts, type in BDGE, find my shit, find my shit, and rate it. I'm out.